um, quite large. But again, thanks for coming. My name is Sue Skinner. I serve as the vice president for mission. Um, I actually started at Hill Murray in 1985, way back in the day when I was a baby teacher. And I stayed for about 20 years. I was um, theology teacher and then director of campus ministry and then assistant principal. And then I left in 2007 and was gone for 14 years. Uh, I served as principal over at Pinnell St. Margaret's in the West Metro and then came back. Keep talking. Oh, thank you. <laughs> then came back last year in this position as vice president for mission. And I gotta say, I'm really excited about this work that you're gonna hear about um, tonight, simply because it really um, speaks to who we are as a school, um, what we care about, our values, our Catholic identity, and really supporting um, our students and supporting our families and, and our mission. So before I turn over to Dr. Glancy, if we could just take that moment to pray as we always do. And I invite us to remember that we are in the Holy Presence of God to begin in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Loving God, tonight, we just lift up our students, our children. We lift them up in prayer. We ask that you protect them, keep them safe. Give them courage, give them wisdom, give them right judgment, fortitude. And we ask the same for ourselves. We know that you have entrusted them to us as parents, as educators, administrators, and again, asking for wisdom, right judgment, insight, all in the context of love, compassion, and mercy, knowing that in everything that we do, you, God, may be glorified. And we pray this in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. And with that, I'll turn it over to Dr. Glancy, our Director of Innovation. What an amazing title, <laughs> right? Here we go. Hello, everyone. Thank you for coming and for showing interest in uh, your student school experience. I really appreciate that, uh, and we all do appreciate that. Let me give a, a quick introduction of myself. Uh, my name is uh, Aaron Glancy. I am the Director of Innovation here. Last year, I was the Director of STEM Education, uh, but this year we changed my title to better reflect the goal of uh, working together across all disciplines, not just science, technology, engineering, and math. Uh, so I'm working on uh, bringing new and exciting things to your children's classroom every day. Uh, hopefully you see some of that work uh, showing up. But tonight, we're here to talk about uh, our schedule review and the process that we've been going through and where we're headed and what you might uh, expect to see coming. So for those of you who are on Zoom, it looks like a lot of people are on Zoom. That's great. Uh, welcome. If you're posting things in chat, I won't be checking those. And there's no there's no moderator here to check those during during uh, during the presentation. So. Um, I'm not sure if there's a way to do it without interrupting the the, the slide. We are recording, yeah. Um, but I think I will try to leave some time at the end for some questions if we have them. Um, but let me uh, give a, a quick outline of what the, the plan is. So the plan is to talk a little bit about the motivation. Why are we reviewing our schedule? Uh, what's the goal? Uh, we want to talk about who we brought in, who we've had working to working with us to uh, help review our schedule, and that's a company called Independent School Management, which I'll tell you about in a little bit. And then we have uh, their findings and recommendations and sort of how we've taken those findings and recommendations and processed them through uh, our own uh, experience, our own research, our own backgrounds uh, to sort of put them together and it's pointing us in, in uh, directions that we hopefully will go in the future. And then we'll finish off by saying what's next as far as uh, a timeline goes. All right. So this work is all uh, grounded in our strategic plan, which is called Go Boldly. So if you're not familiar with the Go Boldly plan, you can find a, a detailed version of it on our website. But uh, there are five pillars of the, of the strategic plan. And here they are. So the first one is, is transformational learning. That's the, the primary pillar. That's the central pillar of our strategic plan. And what we mean by transformational learning is we mean we want to create learning experiences that uh, really change the lives of our students, that transform their lives, that they know before the, before the experience they were one way, and then after that experience, they, they were a new and different person, right? We want those rich, awesome, uh, life-changing experiences. And those can happen on a small scale or on a large scale. But we, we need to, to think, as we're, we're working on this schedule, what sort of schedule is going to support that? What sort of schedule is going to support the rich, engaging, deep 
learning uh, activities that are going to stick with students for the rest of their lives. That's what we're that's what we're looking for as we're making these considerations. Uh, second pillar of our strategic plan is collaborative leadership. Collaborative leadership means that we want uh, teachers working together with administrators. We want students giving feedback. We want parents involved in decisions. And uh, in order for that to happen, we have to have space and structure in our schedule for people to collaborate, for people to work together, for people to uh, engage with each other and share in each other's expertise. Uh, professional excellence is the next pillar. We expect our faculty members to continue to learn, to continue to grow, to continue to push themselves forward. And that requires, uh, again, structures built into our schedule, built into our year, built into our, our calendar that support that, that give the teachers the time and the space to push their profession forward, push their teaching and learning forward so that they are the best they can be for your kids day in and day out. Right? Uh, innovative campus is the, uh, the pillar that challenges us to think about how we use our facilities, how we use our, our time and space here on, on campus in creative ways. What, what use do we make of the Priory na Nature Preserve across the street? Uh, what, do we, what use do we make of the nature paths behind our campus? Uh, uh, what relationship do we have with the monastery next door? Next door. That's uh, what we mean by innovative campus. How do we uh, how do we push the boundaries of learning so that our learning can extend outside of the classroom? We're going to have a lot of learning uh, in the classroom. Our teachers do a great job on a day to day basis of creating excellent activities within the classroom. But we want to see what are some ways we can push that learning outside of the classroom, help it extend into their lives, into their communities. Uh, into the, the state of Minnesota itself and, and the whole world, right? And then the last one is advancing our journey, which is about uh, seeking uh, support from families and donors to be able to uh, achieve these goals. How do we, how do we move forward with, with regard to that? So those are the pillars that are guiding uh, our, any decisions that we make with regard to schedule, right? All right, so now let's talk a little bit about our goals for the schedule redesign. Why is it that we are you know, doing this. Well, many of you know, if you've had students who have been here for more than a couple of years, you know that we've had many schedules in many, in as many years. And that's, that's admittedly not ideal, but we're trying to find the schedule that best supports these, these missions. Uh, and part of the past couple of years were affected by COVID, trying to make some decisions uh, very quickly that should have been uh, stretched out, but they had to be made quickly because of, of COVID and that caused some changes to the schedule. And then from there, we've been trying to figure out how do we move forward? What is the best kind of schedule for, for learning that's gonna support the kind of learning that we are looking for, right? So uh, our first priority is student well-being and academic engagement. We wanna make sure that our students are happy and healthy because that's gonna be the way that they're gonna learn best. If a student is, is, uh, has anxiety, if a student is fearful or does not feel safe or does not feel welcome, then they are not going to be able to learn as best they can. So we need to set up a, a space where our students are happy and healthy uh, and ready to learn, ready to be engaged. Um, we also want to, you know, along with that is supporting transform those transformational learning experiences that I talked about. Uh, and transformational learning, some of the things, some of the uh, buzzwords or, or were things that we can use to, to identify uh, in a more specific way, because transformational learning admittedly is a pretty broad term, but uh, making that a little bit more concrete, we transformational learning involves collaboration. Uh, it involves project-based learning. That's a, a big uh, push we have going on in the school right now. Uh, experiential learning. These are the things that we wanna make sure we can support with our schedule, right? Uh, we want to make sure we can connect the community and students' lives. Um, our portrait of a graduate is that our goal is that when our students graduate, they are resilient, inquisitive, and compassionate leaders, ready to go out in the world and uh, uh, spread <laughs> spread good, right? Uh, so our goal with the, the schedule is, again, to find ways to support that portion of graduate. How do we uh, set up a schedule that's going to allow the students to move towards these goals, move toward becoming resilient, inquisitive, compassionate leaders? Uh, and along with that, we want to have space in the schedule for students to allow their passions, freedom in the schedule, uh, a chance for students to get excited about something and then follow that path. And lots of learning happens when you allow students to do that. But we have to have flexibility. We have to have um, the structures in place to allow that. 
right? That can be uh, academic, that can be athletic, and that can be through clubs and activities. So we wanna make sure we support all of those things. And we wanna to continue to, to work towards having innovative course offerings, right? We wanna make sure that the, the things that we're learning today are relevant to what the students are going to need uh, after high school, after college, uh, in their lives beyond. And those things change over time. So we have to continually make, make sure that we are, are working towards that goal, right? We have some specific challenges that we are working to address. As, as we go through these schedule options and schedule considerations, you'll see that scheduling is a very difficult uh, task. Coming up with a good schedule to effectively use our time and space, it's really, it's not an easy task. Uh, and there's some, some specific things that we want to make sure that we have. Do we have the time in our schedule for these deep learning, experiential, active learning activities that we, we want? Are we making the best use of the time and space that we have? We have uh, a, a beautiful campus and uh, an historic building. Uh, are we making the best use of that, that time, uh, that space? We also want to make sure that the, the schedule is uh, consistent and easy to follow. I think that's been a, a fair fair criticism of this year's schedule is that it uh, that it's a little bit hard to follow. So we want to think, are there ways that we can come up with a schedule that is a little bit easier to follow? And we want to make sure that we find time for faculty to collaborate and develop. And that's something that with our current schedule, there are some strengths to it. There are a lot, actually quite a few strengths to it, according to our the, our consultants. But uh, there are definitely some some issues. And one of them is uh, challenging, it's challenging for teachers to find time to work together in our current schedule. All right. So in order to uh, move forward, we've done our own work. We've done our own research. We've had our own conversations in the building about what uh, we what we want from a schedule, what we think is the best schedule. But we thought this is an important enough decision. This is a, we want to make sure that we get this right so that we don't have to change schedules again uh, in the near future. So we brought in uh, a company called Independent School Management, which has a wealth of expertise in this field. They were founded in 1975. They've served thousands of schools uh, and they work on research. They do their own independent research. Uh, they do professional development and they also do consulting work like the work they did for us. Uh, in specifically, uh, Roxanne Higgins was the person who came and worked with us. She spent a week here on campus with us. Uh, she joined an ISM in 1982. Uh, and she's been the president of ISM since 1991. Uh, she's done the schedule analysis for over 300 schools, and that's not including the hundreds of other schools she's worked with in different capacities. So she's got a lot of experience, experience developing schedules, knows the challenges that schools uh, encounter, and has some creative solutions for how to, to uh, approach them. All right, the, uh, the process, here's a quick overview of the process. We don't have to get into the details of this, but I just wanted to share what, what ex exactly ISM did, they, uh, they did a background review uh, where they looked at all of the materials there. They did a, a student experience profile, which involved uh, a survey of all of our students, a pretty comprehensive survey of all of our students, as well as uh, some focus groups that they met with students. And uh, they also did in interviews with administrators, faculties, and a, a small group of parents. Um, and then they spent a week on campus with us getting to know the school. All right. So let's uh, let's talk about the findings. ISM came with, they, they presented their results to us. Uh, Roxanne presented her results to us in a four hour presentation, uh, which we're, I'm not going to share the entire four hour presentation with you because there was a lot there. Uh, and a lot of it is sort of in the weed stuff that uh, is not necessary for uh, the broader community to consider. But I wanted to highlight some of the strengths that uh, Roxanne and ISM found with regarding the school. Uh, our, the Nicholas Center was, was seen as a strength, both uh, from a facilities perspective and from a learning support perspective. Uh, Global Online Academy, our membership in that was a, a strength. Our web and link programs are great supports for our students. Peer ministry and peer tutoring, our CIS courses, our project-based learning and culturally uh, and linguistically responsive teaching initiatives, to help support our teachers, to be uh, support our students in the best ways possible. Those were seen as strengths. Our Christian service learning pro uh, program was seen as a strength. And it was noted that we had great, uh, great elective options, both in the middle school and the high school, which I think is, uh, uh, I think is awesome for our school. I think it's great that we can support those many electives. Uh, and then we also uh, have fewer requirements and more choice than some of our peer schools, which is seen as a strength, right? All right. Some of the challenges, there were there were many challenges that ISM identified, but some of the ones that I wanted to highlight 
uh, they did they did notice uh, they did find that there's a high amount of anxiety among certain groups of our students, which is something we want to make sure we consider. Remember, one of our key ideas or, or key driving questions is are, are are we supporting our students in terms of health and well-being, right? Uh, another challenge was that we students our students lack freedom compared to some other peer schools. Uh, they're programmed all uh, every minute of the day, and that's not typical for some of our peer schools. And then uh, limited time for teacher collaboration was another um, among many of the, the challenges. All right. So uh, when, uh, sorry about that. When uh, ISM introduced, they, they talked about an ideal schedule. What makes an ideal schedule? And the fact of the matter is, is that uh, there's no such thing as a perfect schedule. And the reason for that is because there are competing interests, right? There are uh, best practices, uh, but there, those best practices intersect with the resources that we have in the building, and they also inter intersect with the unique aspects of our school, our program, our facilities. Uh, all of those things push and pull against each other, uh, as well as the limitations of time and space and uh, human capital that limit the, the choices we could make. If we had infinite resources, infinite space, uh, and infinite teachers, all students could have everything they wanted whenever they needed it, but unfortunately we we don't have that, so we have to make compromises. So uh, we have uh, we have to we have to make compromises, and that's uh, that's what schedule design is. And you'll see we have to make choices as we go along. We have to decide which one is going to be the most important for giving our students the best possible experience that we can. All right. Uh, so ISM, one of the things that they emphasize a lot, which uh, really resonated with many of us is that there are three dimensions of engagement. We want students engaged. We want students participating in their learning, engaged in their learning, uh, because when they do that, they're going to they're going to learn better. Uh, but they've broken it down into three three aspects of of engagement: behavioral engagement, which is students uh, are are following the rules. Their uniforms, they're wearing their uniforms properly. They're not uh, being disruptive in the hallways. They're getting their work done. That's just that's behavioral. Uh, engagement. But there's also cognitive engagement. Are they interested? Are they thinking deeply about the material? Are they engaged in, in the content more than just carrying out the work of school? And then there's also emotional uh, engagement. Do they feel at home? Are they excited about what they're doing? Uh, do they enjoy what they're doing, right? So what, uh, what we want is we want high engagement on all dimensions. We want them to be uh, well-behaved, and cognitively engaged and uh, emotionally happy, right? That's what we want. But what we often see, and this is not this is true not just at Hill Murray, but across the across the country. What we often see is we see high behavioral engagement. Uh, kids will follow the rules. They'll play the game of school, uh, but they are cognitively or emotionally and or emotionally checked out, right? So this is students that play the game of school, and we want to we we want to avoid that. We want our students. Uh, engaged at a higher level. Uh, here at Hillmary, we can we can do better. We strive to do better, and we we will uh, do better than just doing school. All right. So here here's a, a long list of uh, characteristics that ISM uh, lists as characteristics of effective schedules. And I want to go through these fairly quickly, but I just I, I think this is a, is just useful to see all of the factors that, that we are considering as we're trying to craft our schedule, right? So we wanna make sure that students get the courses they need. We wanna make sure that they have a wide variety of choices so they can pursue their passions. Uh, we want to make sure that they have breaks at the right time so that we don't have a cognitive overload throughout the day. Uh, we wanna make sure that it's maximizing learning and well-being, uh, keep stress levels down, rhythm and variety. Uh, we wanna make sure we have time for teachers to prepare and to collaborate. Uh, we wanna make sure that our, our meeting times are at times that are most effective for everyone involved and least disruptive to uh, other uh, events or other uh, parts of the school community. Uh, we wanna make sure that our uh, we, we can support those interdisciplinary ideas, those connections between courses that make the learning uh, more rich uh, and, and deeper. And we wanna make sure that we can accommodate uh, things like problem-based learning and inquiry-based instruction, uh, discussions, field experiences, those sorts of things, right? Uh, as I said before, every schedule is a compromise. So time, space, people, and program components are finite. So we need to make those tough choices. And we wanna say what schedule will support our strategic plan? 
All right. So let's uh, get to some of the recommendations here. <clears throat> we want to find ways to encourage uh, collaboration uh, is one recommendation. Uh, another recommendation is to amplify skills and cut back on content coverage. Uh, this one is, is this was is important. We want to make that learning deep. And the deep learning is the kind of learning that's going to transfer uh, beyond the, the, con the, the specific content of, of a course and is going to allow students to continue to learn and continue to grow after they graduate, right? Uh, there is only so much time in the year, only so much time in the day, and content continues to grow. There is more physics now than when I uh, started as a physics major uh, in 2000 or 1997. Uh, there, there is more history now than when we all went to school. Uh, so content continues to grow. What we need is we need uh, students to have the skills and to be able to uh, learn the content when, when they need to outside of the classroom. So we wanna amplify skills and use the content as a vehicle to develop those skills. Uh, another, uh, another recommendation is to eliminate exam days and encourage an alternative assessment. Now this recommendation is not to eliminate exams completely, it's just to eliminate the special days that we have on the calendar. And you'll see, I think, in the, in the calendar next year that we uh, have moved forward with that. Students will still have exams and courses that require those, but for the many courses that don't, uh, we can just continue to have class and move on, uh, which is more beneficial. Um, we want to find ways to ensure that assessments and assignments don't pile up. This is something in, in terms of managing those students' health and well-being. Uh, that's a, an important recommendation. Creating a math and writing lab uh, staffed by teachers and peer tutors, I think, was a really uh, awesome recommendation. Uh, continue to work on belonging and inclusion has been, that's been a, a goal for us for the past couple of years. Uh, continue to work on interdisciplinary and applied learning courses. Uh, ISM recommended to add a computer science requirement and to promote a consistent application of an empathetic approach to homework and, and assessment. Right. We also recommended a connections program, which would be like an advisory program. In the past, we've had an advisory program. They moved away from it. But uh, that check-in time would be very nice to have uh, just a point person for students to have a check-in on a regular basis, maybe weekly, maybe daily. Uh, so we're, we're thinking through the implications of that. What would a connections program look like and how will we implement that? Uh, creating a personal development curriculum uh, to hit on some of the things that we we do currently do, but can we put those all together and make that into a more organized uh, more organized uh, curriculum, right? And then how do we how do we give students more independence at an age appropriate in age appropriate ways, right? So uh, what independence looks like for a senior is going to be very different than what independence looks like for a sixth grader. But we need to think how do we how do we structure that so that when they come in as sixth graders, by the time they're ready to leave as seniors they're ready to go off uh, into the world. Okay. All right, so here is a, a, a daily schedule option that uh, we are considering. There's a lot of uh, strengths to this. So there's gonna be a, a little bit of in the weeds on this, but we've got a, the middle school on the, on the left and then the, I'm sorry, the middle school on the right and then the high school on the left. Uh, and what this schedule has is it has what ISM calls our carriers, which is basically classes, four classes a day. Uh, so students would have four classes a day. They would have two win periods a day, uh, one 15-minute break for high school. The middle school would not have that 15-minute break. And then in this schedule, the day extends uh, to 2.40. So instead of ending at 2.30, we end at 2.40. All right. Um, additionally, uh, we're considering moving our faculty meetings, instead of after school, moving our faculty meetings to the morning and uh, giving students a late start on one day a week uh, so that the, the faculty have time to meet and collaborate and work together. And we can also pass that along to the students as a chance to get a little extra sleep on one day a week. Uh, we're thinking Wednesdays because it's the day uh, lots of sports happen on Tuesday nights. So that would be nice. Uh, we would still offer, we would still have supervision. So if parents needed to drop their students off, uh, early that you could still drop off at the same schedule, but they would be they would have time to work independently, uh, collaborate with their friends, hang out with their friends in the cafeteria or the common area during during that uh, faculty meeting. Other schools have tried this uh, with great success, and it's been very positively received. And uh, we have a a lot of positive energy in the building around this idea. 
Uh, the yeah. So moving the faculty meetings to the morning and then pushing the late start. So on those days, that would just take away a win. So we would still have the same amount of instructional time on those days. We would just uh, get rid of some of the win time. All right. Uh, this schedule also, this bell schedule, this daily bell schedule also easily accommodates mass. So right now we have to make sure that mass falls on a white day, um, which can be tricky and is also often what often why you will end up switching a day at the end uh, or at last minute uh, because we need white days to have some of these community times, things like mass, things like our speaker series, things like prayer services. This bell schedule, having a consistent bell schedule where it's the same bell schedule every day except Wednesdays, uh, very easily uh, accommodates mass as well as prayer services and other community activities like speakers. All right, so here is, oh, it's a little bit cut off because of the Zoom. Uh, that's just the faculty meeting. So here is under this, uh, under this proposed bell schedule, this is what the high school week would look like. Uh, here we have, uh, you can see the same, I'm gonna walk over here, sorry people on Zoom, we'll be able to see you but uh, hopefully you can get it in context please. Uh, you can see we have the, the same, same bell schedule Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday, and then on Wednesday we just have that late start, push it back in the morning a little bit, but the afternoon is the same. Uh, and what we have here is we have eight day, eight classes, eight class days, one, three, five, and seven meet on the first day, two, four, six, and eight meet on the second day, which is very similar to our white and black days now. The difference is that this, this schedule proposes eight periods instead of seven, which we'll talk about in a minute. So we alternate uh, the odd periods on the first day, even periods on the second day, and then that just goes back and forth. And that would just go back and forth every day. So you know if today was an odd day, then tomorrow would be an even day, and uh, we would just roll with that throughout the year. If there were a snow day, we would just come back. If today was supposed to be an odd day and we uh, had a snow day today, then tomorrow would be an odd day. We would just push it back, uh, all our classes. That way we wouldn't have to, we don't have to worry about balancing class time. We don't have to worry about uh, equity among the periods. All the periods would get the same amount of time because they alternate. All right, um, that's good there. Here's what the middle school, uh, here's what the middle school class would look like. All right, the middle school week would look like, uh, very similar. The, the difference with the middle school is that their win times are pushed, uh, are, are split. So middle school has one win in the morning, one win in the afternoon. On Wednesdays, they only have one win and instead get a short recess after lunch. Um, recess this year has been a huge hit. So we definitely wanna make sure we find space in that in the future. So we go alternate. Now I didn't put the next week, but so this week ends on, a, on an odd day which means the next week would start on an even day, right? So we would have, this week would have three odd days and two even days, even days. the next week would have uh, three even days and two odd days. All right, give you a second to, uh, to put that in, or to take that in. <laughs> okay, so uh, another option uh, where, another option, which came uh, as a recommendation from ISM is to actually rotate our classes. So we would still have odd and even days. If you look carefully at this, you'll see that the first day is an odd day, the second day is an even day, odd day, even day, odd day, even day, but the classes don't all meet at the same time. Uh, they rotate. And the, the logic behind this makes a lot of sense. Uh, you are, uh, it's, you know, kids in the afternoon can be a little bit dead. So if you have math class last period, <laughs> that can be a struggle all year long, right? Uh, maybe first, first period, you're not always awake. So if you always have uh, your English period, which is a lot of discussion, first period, and you're just not ready to have conversations. Rotating the classes, the, the idea behind rotating classes is that you get students and teachers at their best at least sometime during the, during the schedule. Some of the challenges with this option, uh, which you know, make it harder for us to consider is that it makes it difficult for things like our Christian service learning program, where uh, students like to, or students travel off campus uh, and meet with other schools and work with children in elementary schools, that it becomes harder to schedule uh, and more, well, it becomes more challenging to schedule. That and internships and some of the other out of school activities 
make this particular option a little bit more challenging, but it is something that they recommended and it's something we should, I think we, we can consider. Uh, here's what the weekly schedule would look like for the, the middle school, uh, odd, even, odd, even, odd, even. The colors indicate the different, the different periods are, are color coded. So you can see how they sort of travel down. As a former math teacher, I love the patterns that are appearing in this. All right, um, how are we doing on time here? Okay, so there, there's a lot in these two uh, things. I talked a little bit about the rotating periods, but if we, if we just go back to, I'm gonna go back for a second. If we just go back to uh, even these schedules with the alternating block days, the alternating four period or four class days, uh, odd and even days, uh, there are a lot of, of, of pieces to this puzzle that are worth discussing a little bit deeper. So uh, why four longer period days rather than just having all of your classes meet in one day? So there's a lot of, a lot of reasons for this. Uh, one is that longer periods uh, support our goal of transformational learning. And they do that by supporting things like problem-based learning, uh, active learning strategies. Uh, it is hard if you want, if a teacher wants to have a time for uh, uh, individual work so they can develop some skills on their own, some group discussion, so they can work with their peers and, and learn from their peers, and then whole class discussion to wrap up the lesson. To do all of those things uh, effectively so that kids have time to think and, and work uh, in a 40 or 45 minute period is very challenging, right? So longer periods allow for more of these, more of these strategies, more of this transformational learning type things that we're, we're hoping for. Additionally, uh, longer periods or, or having all of your subjects in one day can be overloading, can, can lead to cognitive overload for students. Imagine yourself if you had uh, seven meetings every day or eight meetings every day, uh, that would be incredibly draining. And that's, that's what a typical schedule looks like for kids. They sit through eight different classes. Uh, ISM also has done some research on what they call transition time and uh, having longer periods been, minimizes transition time. So let me talk a little bit about that. So what, what ISM found is that, you know, we, we say, okay, class ends at nine o'clock, the next class begins at 9.05. So we want our teachers to teach until nine and then the next class to start right at 9.05. And what, what they found is that in reality, it doesn't actually work that way. No, the, the best efforts of our teachers, uh, kids need time to decompress from the last class and they need time to get their brains around the new class. Right. So what ISM did is their research was they actually followed students and monitored very carefully with a stopwatch what activities they were doing. Uh, and they found that the transitions are about 13 minutes for students to decompress from one class and get ready and then begin effectively working in the next class is about 13 minutes of class time, not including passing time. Right. So if you take two 40, 40 minute blocks and put them together or, and, and do that, you're going to have transition time at the beginning and end of both of those which is gonna cut off the useful instructional time. Uh, if you put those two blocks together to make one longer 80 minute period, then you only have transition at the beginning and the end once, which is gonna cut down, it's gonna save, uh, it's gonna save time about 25% more by, by their estimate, right? So uh, having these longer blocks uh, minimizes the, the cognitive transitions that the kids need to make. And it's also gonna, it's gonna make, it may seem like less time, but it's going to make the time that we have in the classes more effective. That's the, that's the goal, that's the idea. Uh, a little bit more on extended periods. Some questions that we might have on extended periods would be, isn't it harder for students to focus for longer periods of time? Or don't young kids lose focus uh, in, a, in a 70 minute and an 80 minute period, right? And the, the, the fact of the matter is, yes, they do. Right, but they also lose focus in a forty or forty-five minute period. The the truth is that actual attention spans range from eight eight seconds. Some researchers found to ten minutes. Right, so even in a forty minute period, we're losing focus and regaining focus multiple times. So when uh, a quote, this is a quote. I'm sorry. Yeah. So any, any length of time longer than ten minutes is, is going to be hard to focus. Uh, how are you guys all doing out there? Um, <laughs> I'm thirty minutes in to my uh, my lecture here. Uh, so maybe you can count back and see that you've lost focus two or three times already. Um, so here's a quote from, from ISM. Students who say they can't attend any longer after 40 to 45 minutes are really saying they can't tolerate it anymore, likely due to information overload and boredom. 
What, we're, what we need to do, or what our teachers are great at doing is refocusing the students as throughout the classes, right? So what we do by having longer periods, it allows us to do those transformational, those active, those uh, engaging, more engaging and more involved activities in class. Uh, and then the teachers can work to refocus the kids as they work, work through those. Sure, if we're going to have, you know, 70 minute lectures, that's going to that's going to be challenging for the students to maintain focus, but that's not what we're going for. Right? Uh, so, like I said, engagement, this kind of a engagement calls for different kinds of instruction. Right? All right. And uh, just uh, in response to problem based learning as a as a pedagogy uh, problem based learning, the AP uh, College Board. Uh, did a study of several thousand high schoolers and found that in AP courses, so some of the you know strictest, most rigorous courses we have here at our school, uh, that in AP courses, uh, PBL, problem-based learning, uh, the problem-based learning approach, the students scored better than they did in a traditional approach. So we think there's, there's research behind wanting to move towards this type of instruction, not to mention the benefits from, uh, you know, cognitive overload and from preparing students for uh, more wor work that's more authentic to life outside of, of high school and middle school. All right. All right. How am I doing on time? Okay. Um, okay. So another, another question what might we have, why, why do we alternate days? Wouldn't it be better for classes to meet every day? All right. And this is, this goes back to time being a limited resource. Uh, so if we want to have those longer periods and we want to have students uh, be able to engage in these, uh, you know, rich activities uh, over longer periods of time, then we can't fit all of those, we can't fit all eight classes into one day, right? So we want to, uh, we have to spread them out. Some options, uh, other schools that I, I am aware of go on a semester, so you take all four classes in the fall and then four different classes in the spring rather than eight year-long classes uh, that alternate, and that's one approach. Uh, but the, there's some down, there's some, some negative aspects of that approach as well. Uh, here, one of the, one of the reasons why this may actually be a, not a bug, but a, a benefit, why alternating courses may actually turn out to be a benefit is because there's some research, uh, specifically from a book called Make It Stick by Peter Brown, which shows that, uh, relearning, uh, forgetting and then relearning something is actually a more effective way of making something stick in your long-term memory uh, than just learning it shallowly, uh, you know, learning it rote uh, temporarily for, let's say, an assessment uh, at the end of the week, and uh, then forgetting it after the assessment, right? So the repeated uh, learning, forgetting, and then being remembered, re you know, reminded, you know, you come back and the teacher will do a quick activity at the beginning of class to remind the students what they did and they've forgotten, but they have a, a quick jog of their memory. And now that, that act of forgetting and then re-remembering, uh, actually helps to, to make the learning, uh, stick. All right, let's see. Another, uh, important feature of this, uh, another important feature of the schedule, you notice that, that we have wind times every um, every day except on Wednesday. Wednesday was the, the one day that uh, shortened winds because of the late start. But Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday, the schedule would have two wind periods for, for all the students. Uh, now, uh, ISM, their recommendation is a minimum of 90 minutes for uh, work that's outside of class work every day, a minimum of 90 minutes every day. And there's, a, there's many reasons they make that recommendation. First of all, is that uh, wind time and breaks give students and teachers time to connect individually with each other and, uh, well, student to student and student to teacher and teacher to teacher, right? These, these times for connection are, are really important because students are all in different places. They're all learning at different rates. They're all learning in different ways. So uh, the whole class discussion or the whole class presentation might need, or often, almost always needs follow-up, needs that, that uh, time for the teacher to connect. And they can make those times in, in their classes, but adding wind time uh, and break time gives even more time and even more space for that sort of interaction to happen. Uh, wind times also allow for clubs and activities. Uh, currently, our clubs and activities, as a club, as uh, someone who who runs two clubs, the Rocket Club and the Aquaponics Club, I know uh, we meet during wind times, 
And uh, it's, it's challenging to get those scheduled because currently wind times um, are not consistent because we have lots of wind on white days, not so many wind days, wind times on black days and no wind times on green days. So if I need something to happen at the end of a week, but it can't because uh, there's a green day and no win, that's challenging in terms of scheduling uh, clubs and activities. But uh, under this new proposed schedule, win times are the same time, uh, Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday, and it doesn't matter whether it's an odd day or an even day. So clubs could meet every Monday or, or uh, student council could meet every Friday. Uh, there is a benefit of the rotating schedule as well as the consistency of the same time every day for certain things uh, in having those wind times like that. Uh, again, these wind times and breaks uh, support health and well-being. ISM presenting quite a lot of research on, which I, I have a little bit for it to share with you, but they, they had an extensive amount of research on the uh, stress levels among kids and how how detrimental that can be to their success and their ability to learn. And having wind times and breaks built into the day at regular scheduled times, uh, or you know, at times that break up the day in good chunks, which this schedule does, can really support that that mental health and and well-being. And then the last thing is is uh, I think is really important is this idea of uh, motivation and time management. So one of the most uh, one of the best predictors of success in college and beyond is not grades or test scores. It's actually ability to use your uh, white space effectively, right? And when if kids are programmed all the time and then go off to college and have freedom to do whatever they want, that can be a big shock for many students, right? So having time like win time and uh, breaks built into the schedule allows students in a safer uh, safer space where the consequences, well, well, there's more supports, there's more supports in the building uh, to help them to navigate those times and learn how to use their time uh, their time effectively. And we, we envision, I think what we envision is, uh, you know, a gradual release of responsibility as kids get older. So with younger kids, we have, it's more programmed what we ask them to do during uh, wins and free free periods and free time. And then as they get older, uh, they have more freedom to do it, uh, to do with that time, what they feel is best for them. W literally making it what I need time, which is where the WIN acronym came from. All right. Uh, so like I said, about that stress and anxiety here, here is just a little bit of research from uh, the Pew Research Center. And uh, highlighting here, um, the top bar on both of these graphs. So on the left, you'll see that 70% of students, 70% uh, of teens uh, feel that anxiety and depression is a major problem. Uh, that's a huge number. <laughs> and that's a, that's a troubling number. Uh, and then about 60% uh, of, of teens feel a lot of pressure uh, to get good grades. And that's, you know, we want them to, to get good grades. We want them to be motivated to get good grades. But we, we, when we pair that very large pressure to get good grades, along with the anxiety and depression, you can't help but notice the connection between those two, right? So we want to make sure that we're pushing our children to exceed and excel and do the best they can, but we're doing it in ways that are supportive and allow them to, uh, you know, stay healthy and happy and not be not be depressed because that's actually going to help them to learn better and do better and achieve better uh, which will hopefully lead to those good grades that they so crave all right uh eight periods is another aspect of that proposed schedule that is worth um is worth discuss discussing discussing so our the plan, the recommendation, and I think our plan, if we went this way, would be would uh, be to not not inquire encourage students to take a, an eighth class. Matter of fact, we would uh, not not allow students to take an eighth class unless it was a a, a unique or extenuating circumstance. Uh, so the the reason for that there's there's several reasons why this is a beneficial thing to do. But this would this would add what we're what we've been talking, calling a pioneer period, which would be a, a period uh, that is used for a variety of things. So students who need extra help in math and writing, that math and writing lab we suggested earlier, uh, 
a math and writing lab wouldn't be very useful if students never had time to go to it, right? But if we have a pioneer period, then students can go to the math and writing lab. Now you may say, well, why can't they go to it during win? Well, the, the problem is, is that during win time, everyone is free at the same time. And that's great because everyone can be free at the same time to do clubs and activities. But it's also challenging because if everybody who needs math help is going to the math lab at the same time, that means that the math lab is gonna be overrun and the students aren't gonna get the help they need. But if we have a pioneer period, which is spread out throughout the eight, eight period uh, cycle, um, then students will be able to uh, go to the math lab when they have that pioneer period, if they need extra help. For the students who don't need extra help, Maybe they can be a peer tutor and work in the math lab to support their peers, or maybe they can be work in the writing center to uh, support their peers, or uh, there's a, a variety of other options. This is something where we're, we're thinking if we go this route and have a pioneer period, what would that look like? What are we going to do with that period? What are we going to... Uh, uh, how are we going to make effective use of that? Currently, we pull students out of class for counseling activities, for things like uh, you know, preparing for college, for registration, for uh, a variety of different things. If we had a pioneer period, we would not have to pull them out of class. They could meet during their pioneer period. So there are many non-core uh, class activities that need to happen. And this pioneer period is a place where we could, uh, we could put the slot those in without impacting the, um, without impacting those core courses, right? Uh, for middle school, I think the, the plan for middle school would be to add, add electives, uh, a social emotional learning course, uh, a technology course, uh, so to add a study skills course, to add those things in the middle school, so the student middle school students wouldn't have a free period, uh, they would have uh, a little bit more options for taking some electives, but they would also probably have uh, some additional uh, core course or or uh, fundamental or important uh, things that we want all of our students to have, right? So everyone would take the SEL course. Uh, we have to consider what would go in that and what that would look like. But these are, uh, you know, again, things that we do a little bit of now, but they happen through our counseling program and they happen as pullouts. Uh, so they disrupt and they interrupt other classes, right? Under this schedule, they wouldn't have to do that. All right. And then from a logistics perspective, uh, eight periods is actually can be actually really beneficial, right? <clears throat> so uh, I love these puzzles. Uh, as soon as I heard this, I immediately thought of this puzzle. And then Roxanne in her presentation had a picture of one. And I was like, oh, yeah. Uh, so this is one of those puzzles where it, you want the goal is to get all the numbers into order. And the way you do that is by sliding, sliding the, the buttons around, right? Uh, and you couldn't solve this puzzle if all the boxes were full. Because if all the boxes are full, there's no place to move anybody. There's no place to slot anybody in and out, right? So adding the eighth class, adding the eighth period to the day or to the cycle without having students schedule another class makes the scheduling process a lot easier. And it makes it easier in a couple of different ways. One, it makes it easier to schedule students and teachers together. So we have less conflicts, which means more students will get the classes that they want to take, right? Uh, and that's important. We currently we're at about 85% success rate, which is good. But uh, ideally, uh, you know, according to this, according to ISM, uh, we should be at the 95 and higher rate, success rate. So we can do better. So 85 is pretty good, but we, we can do better. And this would be one thing which would help us. Um, additionally, it will help us in terms of our, it doesn't actually create more space. Our space is our space. But in a sense, it creates more opportunities to use the spaces. Because if you have seven times the number of rooms, uh, that's a certain number of you know opportunities to use a space. When you have eight times the same number of rooms, that's more opportunities to use those spaces. And that you know doesn't really make much uh, of a difference because the kids have to be somewhere. So our spaces are, are still gonna be full, but it does make a difference in terms of, for example, our science classrooms. So right now, uh, our science classrooms are, uh, we have one, one complete science lab for our chemistry classes and we have eight chemistry sections. So with seven periods in our day and eight chemistry classes, they can't all have class in the, in the full chemistry lab. So one of our sections has to make do in a room which is not specifically designed for chemistry. Uh, we have similar issues with, uh, with some of our other, some of our middle school science classrooms that are meeting in non-science classrooms. And our teachers do a great job dealing with those issues and uh, the kids probably don't even notice. But if we can get those kids uh, 
into the, the classrooms that are designed specifically for those purposes, they're going to have a better experience. Uh, and adding an A period will make that a little bit easier because of that, that space to, um, to, to move things around. And then it can also lead to uh, less movement of teachers, right? So we can uh, schedule it uh, a little bit easier so that teachers aren't running from the third floor to the first floor to the third floor uh, every other period, which in some cases, in a lot of cases, it's not for our teachers, but there are a handful of teachers, depending on the course load they teach, that's the, that's what they're doing. And that's not ideal for them. And if it's not ideal for them, it's uh, not ideal for their, their students. Right. Okay. So adding that eighth period has a lot of, of, of benefits. Uh, and I think I'm okay. I'm running out of time, but I'm almost done. So that's good. <laughs> um, so some other considerations that were recommended, uh, which are uh, kind of exciting. One recommendation was a five term year uh, I don't think uh, we are quite ready for this, but it's something to consider down the road. Uh, five term year, that would look like we'd have a short term at the beginning of the year. The, the, the thought was 12 days. So 12 days at the beginning of the year where students engaged in some one thing really deeply. They did it all day long. Maybe it was a, a, a big service learning project that they spent 12 days working on that one project. Or maybe it was a trip to France uh, that they spent a week uh, in a immersion in, in France. Uh, so there's, you know, lots of, uh, so they would do that at the beginning of the year. Then in January, we, um, we had the two last two weeks where students did lots of projects in some of their classes. You may have heard about that. Hopefully some of your students told them, told you about some of the projects they were doing, but there were lots of projects happening over the past two weeks. And it was really, really kind of high energy, really kind of neat. So this having these sort of terms like a J term in the, in January, and then a end of the year term and the beginning of the year term. That's a that's a I think a really creative and really awesome uh, idea. I'm not sure that uh, that's where we want to go right now, but um, it's, it's something to consider. Another recommendation, which was really interesting, was to create a house system, kind of like in the Harry Potter books, uh, where we divide the kids up into houses, and then we can have competitions and just sort of fun, really fun things to get the kids excited, really engage that emotional uh, uh, level of engagement, get them you know excited and and. Uh, working together with their friends, and then some interdisciplinary courses. So those there were many recommendations that Roxanne uh, and ISM made, and we've also been considering many different things. But I think you can see that there are uh, that building a schedule and coming up with the best schedule is very challenging. There are a lot of factors to consider, and there's always going to be trade-offs. Uh, and we have to weigh those trade-offs as to what we think is is most important for giving the best possible experience for our students. Uh, and that uh, is what's going to lead us to our final decision. So next steps, we, uh, we are synthesizing the recommendations and feedback. We're putting that together, uh, working on making our final decisions, which we plan to share with the community in the coming weeks and months. So I'll be looking forward to the, the final versions. And then once we have that, there will be lots of details. If we move forward with the eighth period, there will be lots of details as to how we use that eighth site carrier, what that, what that will look like, what we'll, uh, we'll do with that. Um, so we'll continue to develop that over time, but the, the nuts and bolts, the, the, the important skeleton uh, of the, what the schedule is gonna look like, we should be ready to share in the, in the next few weeks. Um, and I just wanna bring it back to and finish with our strategic plan, right? Because this is what is driving this is what's driving our decisions. Our, how does our schedule support transformational learning? How does it support collaborative leadership? How does it support professional excellence? How does it allow us to think innovative, in innovative ways about our campus? Right. That's what we're what we're going for, what we're shooting for, and uh, what we're trying to do to make the best possible schedule. All right. Uh, that is all I had, and I think I have about five minutes left where I can try to respond to some questions. And again, we haven't finalized any decisions yet, so if you want to know, are we doing this or are we doing that, I can't really answer that. But if you have questions about what I presented here or, or other ideas, uh, please feel free to share. And Zoom, I can take a quick peek at the, those questions too. Uh, will these will these decisions be solidified before registration of classes for next year? The answer to that is yes, right, Sue? Yes, they will be uh, finalized before 
uh, before registration. There, there might be um, some, some of the details as to what a connections program would look like. Uh, that, that sort of thing might not be finalized before, uh, before registration, but the, the courses that the students choose, that will be, uh, and what the schedule will look like will be finalized before registration. Uh, yes. 